Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome everybody to tonight's episode of Profound States. Tonight we have a very special guest, uh, Gabrielle Highcamp. Hope I said that correctly. Yes. Uh, she was born in uh, born and raised in Germany in the fifties. Had an invisible friend in school times. Uh, due to her brother's death in '68, she thought of the afterlife because he was still around, or she could still feel him around. Uh, she had an NDE in '81 in India, where she traveled in quest of her life's purpose. Uh, she was a Rosicrucian uh, after that for over 20 years. Worked as a graphic designer. Her first husband committed suicide in 2004, and she felt him around also. Her, after her uh, second husband, the love of her life, died of cancer, and she was with him in hospice. She started her mediumship training in 2010. She is a QHHT practitioner since 2018. She started channeling in 2019 after visiting the Bosnian pyramids and, the Su and a Sufi sheikh there. Uh, since then, she's in contact with the spirit world. Uh, mostly to help with readings, public demonstrations, and messages, or, or training perception groups in a spiritual center nearby. Uh, she had a near-death experience, an out-of-body experience with ETs on ships. Also, um, she did remote viewing on another planet. Uh, telepathic. She's had telepathic contact with entities, elementals, and ETs. Uh, got a nudge from guys to do more. So she wanted to share her knowledge and experiences to help, to maybe help others understand their own experiences. And she has many uh, stories and experiences. And now that I've finally finished that uh, humongous uh, construct of a lot of life that she has lived, uh, welcome uh, Gabrielle Highcamp to our show, to the show. Hello. Thank you, Mike, for having me. How are you doing today? I'm fine. Good. Uh, so let us get started. So um, I guess the very first thing I would ask you is, um, what's the very earliest moment you remember of having any odd experience in your life? Uh, you know, like uh, anything you can think of that that you would consider out of the ordinary, or most people would consider out of the ordinary. What was the first memory you have of anything like that in your life that you can recall? I have a memory. I'm three years old. I'm sitting in the living room with my family, father, mother, and four siblings. And I'm looking around knowing this is my family. But I'm thinking, what am I doing here with these people? And I always had the feeling I don't belong there. I had the imagination I was switched at hospital and belonged to another family. Maybe not even from this world, from this planet. I always felt alien and strange. But that's my first memory, as if the soul just kicked in in the situation with the family looking around and thinking, whoa, where am I? Who are these people? And I know that I felt ashamed because I knew this is my biological family. And I know that I shouldn't think of them like that, these people, to name them like, like that. So I already had some kind of cognitive dissonance knowing there is some memory with truth in it and I can feel it and I know it. I don't belong here. What am I doing here with these people? And on the other hand, there was the knowledge, well, these are my parents and my siblings and I'm part of this family and I'm sitting here in the living room with them and I'm three years old. So I was... I was going to ask you how old you were, but you just told me you were three years old. So, oh God, my my video, my my lighting is way too hot. Uh, well, it's weird. I turned off. The, oh, must be the other one. Hold on. Let me see if I can make this better. Here we go. Yeah. Well, that's really odd because I have no. I turned off my light completely. And I turned down my other monitor. Oh, it's out. It must be outside. It must be coming from outside. It's very bright. Oh, well, we'll deal with it as it is. So 
you were three years old, you looked around, you felt out of place, and you wondered, who are these people? So take it from there and go through whatever experience you feel is most important to mention next in your life that was odd and made, you know, it could be anything. Um, um, I know that I played a lot as a small child in the bushes in the garden, not in the open, but in the bushes. And I think that I had contact with fae and fairy and elementals there. I was playing. I was totally in fantasy world. I have no special memories of that. And then when I um, had to start with school at the age of six, I had this invisible friend. To me, it looked like a school kid. And I had I saw no difference between this kid and the other kids in the school. He was wearing the same clothes. He also had this knapsack on his back. And I was hanging around with this kid after school. So I always came late home uh, to, to have the meal together with the family. And they were always angry with me and shouted at me, why don't you come at the right time? Things like that. And I always told, oh, I was with so-and-so. I had a name. So even my parents and family thought this is a, another school kid. And one day, again, I was late and my eldest sister was at the table and I, I said, oh, I was again with that kid, with so-and-so. And we were um, in front of the little uh, village shop, in front of the window. And then my eldest sister started, you are lying. I saw you there and you were alone, on your own. There was no one with you. So then I noticed, oh, there must be something wrong. And uh, my father hit me because I lied. So I learned quickly to keep quiet about these things. But I had a lot of uh, perceptions and I think I had a lot of contact, which I tried to suppress until, um, let's put it in words like that, until my life's path threw something into my way to open my eyes and I started the mediumship trainment and then everything made sense. So so the little boy, um, was he Fay or what, what was the little boy? What Did you figure that, all that out? Up to now, I haven't figured out. I don't even know whether it was a boy or a girl. And nowadays, since the contacts that I have um, out of body at night in ships with Pleiadians, I get the feeling maybe it was them, some of them, to help me through my childhood, accompany me in that form. Or maybe it was a fae. I don't know. I haven't figured it out. I'm still learning and trying to put together all the puzzle pieces. Okay, so you must, he must, okay, I've heard, um, I was watching a video the other day and the, and the guy was saying that he thought phase were fallen uh, spirits and you sound like you don't believe that. You, you believe, no. you, it no, sounds like you believe that the fae are very positive spirits or positive the spirits. They have been on earth before humans. They are older than us but they are not physical, not in the sense we know physical three-dimensional three world. They're fourth dimensional, lower or middle fourth, dynam fourth dimension. And they're not fallen spirits or fallen angels. That's uh, a totally uh, misunderstanding. That's not the case. So, and I even think that angels and ETs are not the same, like some uh, people from the ancient aliens theory uh, want to, to form it. I was told by my guides that angels are a separate creation, and ETs also. Well, okay, so take us forward 
to the next uh, notable event in your life when something happened. Uh, you were playing with a little boy. Uh, you still don't know who he was, but obviously he was somebody you enjoyed because you wouldn't be staying after school, hanging out with him if he was scary. So obviously he was enjoyable. And so take us to the next event in your life beyond the little boy that was notable in your life, something good, uh, interesting. Mm, let me just add that um, I had no friends because I always felt so alien and I had difficulties finding friends. So that was my only friend. And he was very, very positive. Without him, I think I wouldn't have made my childhood. So um, I think the next really, the next real important thing that hit me was uh, my brother's death. I was 12 years old and he was 16 and he died in a motorcycle crash. And I woke up in the middle of the night. I had a sleeping room together with my uh, sister and I heard my mother sitting on her bed and t uh, talking to her and saying that um, our brother will never come back again. And they were crying and I didn't understand anything. And um, I think then I fell asleep again. And in the morning, uh, the whole family came together and we were told that our brother had died in this motorcycle accident. Well, that was a thing. I couldn't even understand that because, uh, well, the first time for me as a chill as a child to to confront death, and um, I had the feeling that he's still around. I could feel him, and so I tried to search for this invisible realm in which he resides, and uh, I couldn't see him, but I, I felt him. And I was very much drawn to the beyond or to the, um, let's call it the realm of the deceased spirits. And I couldn't find the realm, couldn't find the entrance. But I think, as I found out later with a shaman, if you have some kind of trauma, and that was a trauma for me as a child to... to uh, yeah, to feel this loss of my brother. And uh, then it can happen that you leave a part of your soul outside of your body. And later on in my mediumship, I found out that the first that came to me, uh, I think there's an order in it, but I also had resonance were the deceased. So since a part of my soul went to the beyond with my brother when he died in childhood, I had the door always a little bit open, so no wonder that I was drawn to this uh, invisible, the unseen, the mysterious, the beyond, however you like to call it. So, um, what was the next thing that happened in your life? You Okay, so you, your brother died and... Um, in 68 and you felt him around you then you had a near-death experience in 81 in india so was there anything uh notable in your life that happened between your brother's death and your uh nde in 81 is there anything between those two events that was notable two minor things i had a repeating dream that was a funny thing i I always, um, it was, I think it was a lucid dream and he kept repeating and repeating and repeating with no solution. I woke up and I was uh, sitting with my arms around my legs and there was somebody behind me who had his arms around me and I couldn't figure out, is it good? Is it bad? Is he holding me or is he... Um, trying to keep me from something or is he capturing me and I couldn't turn my head and I couldn't um, 
look up. So my sight in the other realm was blocked. And um, I remember that one once I asked, who are you? And that's the key phrase if you encounter any being. And it took me so long to ask that. And I got the answer, Greg. That's an American or an English name, unusual for Germany, and I couldn't make anything out of it. So still a case unsolved. Um, another thing that also happened in India was um, when I met Sai Baba, because I was kind of hippie generation and I was looking for enlightenment and uh, had the funny idea, I just have to uh, journey, travel to India and go to the ashram and see the sky, Sai Baba, and maybe he will look at me and ploofs, I will, will be enlightened. The kind of funny dreams that uh, teenagers have. <laughs> I was in Sai Baba's ashram when I saw the guy and he opened his mouth and I heard his voice Something in me shut close and I heard inside of myself the voice, you cannot be my master. I was looking for a master, so I was blocked in that. And later on, I found out uh, that it was very good for me that I did not uh, went into that trap of uh, looking for a master. I think it's a trap on the spiritual path. That's what I think today. <laughs> So what was the other event you had? OK, so you 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 had uh, Greg put his arms around you. And, yes, uh, you had uh, you were looking for um, a guru in India and yes. uh, in Sai Baba's camp. And is that um, and you were told basically not to that you shouldn't have a guru. But uh, is that the two events you're talking about? Is that all? of Yes. That? OK, so um, you had an NDE in 81 in India. Tell us about that NDE. Well, I'm not the kind of person who reads a lot of books or guides before traveling. I was uh, totally into this idea going to India uh, on my quest for, I don't know what, the mission of my life or maybe a guru or whatever. So. Uh, I happened to uh, travel to the Taj Mahal, to the town Agra, where it is. And um, I just thought in my juvenile uh, stupidity, well, if I'm in this town already, I can go see this monument. Although I never liked museums and things like that to visit. But I went there. It was during the day and there's a kind of... Um, showroom of a tomb with two sarcophagi in in uh, marble and um, i walked around in a circle with a group of tourists and i was very disappointed because i felt nothing i had the idea i maybe this uh, grand monument of the uh, great love of this uh, persian uh, shah who ruled over that uh, kingdom there in india Maybe it should emit some emotion, something, some mystery. I was looking for mysteries and things like that, and nothing happened. So I was disappointed. I went back to the hotel and talked to some guys, and they told me, oh, you have to go there in the night, especially at full moon, then the white marble will reflect the moonlight, and the whole thing will look like a crazy spaceship. And you have to meditate before and you have to concentrate and go in with a special attitude and things like that. So I did that because the next night was full moon. And then I entered the same showroom on the first floor and suddenly I saw a black hole in one corner of the room where there was an entrance to uh, some kind of uh, underneath chamber under this showroom which I hadn't noticed uh, during the day before. And I was magically drawn to that uh, black hole in the floor, although something in me was fearful and resisted. And I went in there and uh, went down the staircase of stones. 
And in this chamber were the two real sarcophagi, and they have equal size, they're both the same, and they have no inscription to show this is the sarcophagus of the, the husband, and that's the one of the wife. They're equal, you can't um, discern which is which. And I went in there and I touched one and I knew, don't ask me where or how I did know that, I knew that's the sarcophagus of the woman. And I had the feeling I've got something to do with her. Don't know what. Well, and then there was a guy sitting with a, with a candle and he was chanting an om as if a welcome to this chamber. But, you know, I've never experienced sound in a stone chamber. It's like in the pyramids in Gizeh. There's a special resonance. And that guy, well, his ohm nearly blew my mind. And from that on, I don't know anything more how I came back into my hotel. I think I was out of body. I felt myself in the famous tunnel but I didn't uh, get through to the light. I went in the tunnel and then there was a wall with big stone blocks, monolithic blocks that blocked the way and I had to stop. And I stood in front of this wall and asked myself, well, what am I doing here? Um, and then suddenly appeared uh, some writing on the stone wall, and it was really biblical. <laughs> it was a flaming writing as if flames uh, formed the words, and there I could read, you're not dying now, go back to Germany, it's around your corners, the Rosicrucians have the knowledge you seek. So, <laughs> I got my answer. <laughs> And I woke up in my hotel room uh, the next morning and I felt very weak and I didn't leave the room for three days. I couldn't speak, I couldn't uh, eat and I had no, um, not even the, the need for food, uh, um, only drinking. And after three days I made up my mind, okay, that message was clear. Now I'm going to arrange my journey back home. And uh, let's see what will happen there. I will meet the Rosicrucians. <laughs> so that was it. So did you find out what what caused your NDE yet? Did you ever figure that out? Um, I have my own th private theory. Because when I happened to be in a free yoga lesson of a friend, she started singing the mantras in Sanskrit and I felt a sensation. My whole left side of the body was growing bigger and bigger as if it's three or four meters high or tall. And um, I found out later on that I had some incarnations in India, so it makes sense. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's an old connection. <laughs> some glimpse. <laughs> some snippets of uh, former lives, although they're not really former or past because uh, the, the spirit world tells me hard to wrap your mind around. Time is an illusion. It doesn't exist, like all the old masters also said. So there is no past and there is no future. They, they're more or less all parallel lives and I can dive into them even with remote viewing and get some more information if I want to. So you spent 20 years as a Rosicrucian. Uh, with all that, um, okay, so on the other side, they told you that the Rosicrucians had all the answers. And then you spent 20 years learning those answers with them. So can you... Um, Give us a snippet of the deepest or most profound understanding that you've derived from that 20 years without spending more than three or four hours giving it. <clears throat> I'll try my very best and I ask for inspiration to put good words in my mouth by spirit. 
Um, I think the most important thing is that we need to know ourselves. Like in the uh, old temple, the Greek temple in Delphi already was uh, written above the entrance, human, know thyself. And this means you're not only this body, this person, this personality and character, you are also an embodied soul with a divine spark of light. And this divine spark of light has a mission. And earth is a school for the soul to grow. So the soul will choose experiences that you as a person will not like, but the soul has got another, a different perspective. It will choose even once the spiritual world, They, my guides showed me um, a crippled body and there were standing souls in line to incarnate into a crippled body. And I asked them, why would one do that? And they said, well, in 10 lives of 10 brave citizens, you can only learn this much. In one life as a cripple, where you will touch everybody who meets you, who sees you, you can learn this much. That's why they're taking more load upon their shoulders as a soul, because they want to grow and have a lot of experience to whatever theme they are choosing as a soul. Might be pain, might be uh, whatever disease or betrayal or whatever. So basically what you're saying is, is that suffering is exists because it helps you uh, evolve unfortunately it does did buddha ever did buddha ever figure that out i mean he understood the nature of reality that everybody goes through suffering did he understand that suffering or did he ever come to that to the conclusion that suffering exists for man's evolution? Did he ever, did you ever hear him say that? I, I'm very much into Buddhism. I like him. Um, I don't think that he said it like that. He understood where it came from and he knew how to overcome it. And this was his teaching to, uh, to bring to the people ways how to overcome it. And he was very much into the middle path. If you look at the, um, uh, you, Jewish and Hebraic tradition of the tree of life, there you also have the middle path. That's the only line in the whole geometric, geometric construction that goes from the bottom to the top or from the top to the bottom. The other two lines in the construct of the tree of life, they don't go, uh, they don't start at the very bottom and they don't go to the very top. So they are sidelines, and he was um, he was the man of the middle path because he knew it's all about balance. This world is polarity. We live in a dual world. We have good and bad, and we are not meant to judge bad as negative. It's just an experience. We have light and day. We have male and female. So we have polarity. And we can only overcome this if we unite in ourselves and we got the divine spark and the, the soul to, to make this experience, to, to expand consciousness, to come to the point to understand, oh, I'm more than this body, than this person. I'm a divine soul embodied in an incarnation here on earth to make a human experience, to learn and grow as a soul from that. Okay, so that's a different perspective. And then maybe you can embrace some of the not so nice experiences and grow even faster. So all the traditions, all the messengers, uh, I think they only tried to show us the way how to overcome this. And nowadays, even quantum science is saying, well, we, we are creating all this. If you send out the energy by a bad thought, then you are attracting bad things. So this reality is a simulation and we are 
the souls in an avatar body in the video gaming word uh, language sense and we're just making experiences how to get out of this game so okay so in 2010 your second husband died of cancer and you were with him in the hospice and you started your mediumship uh, training so how did that how did you get from uh, his death to becoming a medium? Uh, give us a short uh, piece of how you went from A to B in that situation. Oh, that was just within two or three weeks. <laughs> I would have never chosen to stay with him at the moment of death because I thought, well, that's that's horror. I how can I how can I uh, be there? and endure that but it was really a process when i stopped fighting and accepted what was happening and no longer denied that he was dying and i couldn't do anything but be there be with him i got the feeling as if i was involved with white clouds something like um, something very fluffy and soft and i I didn't feel bad. That was the funny thing. I felt elevated. I felt nearly high. Some of my friends asked me after uh, my husband died, well, what did the doctor prescribe to you? I'd like a bit of that too. And I said, well, that was a spiritual experience to, to watch him leave his body and go over to the other side. And now I want more of that. I, I had a glimpse into this other side um at the moment of his death i saw him on the other side he was jumping and dancing with joy and so i thought in my head well okay even i can understand this there is no misinterpretation interpretation this is joy you're happy you're good on the other side your body is fine you're dancing okay so that's all that i wanted to know at that moment for the man I love, that he's good, healthy, wealthy, and fine. So, and I saw him dancing, so that only moved me to, to um, go further into that direction. And I started searching for medium train, uh, trainment on the internet. And when I found my teachers, I felt him like fire on my left side of the body. And I saw him jumping and he was shouting, yes, yes, go there. I come with you. That's good. That's your right direction. Something like that. So it started like that. So your second husband pushed you to become a medium. Yes, more or less, that was his gift. <laughs> and I'm still very grateful for that. Um, okay, so before we get into your mediumship, um, I guess you mentioned that you were a QHHD practitioner since 2018. So, um, of all the... Um, I assume you went in person to learn QHHD up to wherever they teach, yes? No, I did it online. So, you, okay, so I was... That's level, oh, one, level one practitioner. I was under the impression you couldn't get level one online, that you had to go in person. Is it, can you... It was it was like that in the beginning. I can understand that because Dolores wanted it like that. And I can understand her very well, but uh, with more time, I think her daughter um, brought up the idea, well, why not open at least the level one for online people? Um, not everybody can come to America. So they started it. And um, yeah, that was good for me because it was the right timing when I, when I was uh, sent the name Dolores Cannon uh, three times. I heard it three times. And I also already already learned that the spiritual world, they send you messages. Sometimes it's a name and you better Google it if you hear it two or three times. 
So I did that and I was overwhelmed because my soul was jumping in my body and was saying, yes, 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 that's the direction, go and do that. And I wasn't that happy because I already had done and uh, paid uh, quite a good amount of money for um, hypnotherapy training. But that was more from a guy who came from this uh, TV and show business side. And I was more or less shocked because I understood, whoa, that's a great force. You can work with the subconscious during hypnosis. And what are they doing? They uh, let people uh, play the chicken on stage. So I wasn't happy with that. And I decided before I do an online training uh, of Dolores Cannon's QHHT, I'm going to experience it myself because that was what I missed at the Rosicrucians, it was only theory and I wanted practice. I was hungry for practice. I wanted to feel and touch the things. So I found a practitioner. She was only 11 minutes away from me. Look at the numbers, 11. I, I think it's very funny, these synchronicities with 1, 1, 11, 11 and things like that. And it was really great. Uh, my own first uh, session, I was in a temple in Sumeria and I got an initiation with light and sound and uh, I could watch it and I have the audio still. And at the end of the hypnosis session, suddenly my subconscious uh, says, this is not her incarnation, that's a sister's incarnation. We gave her and is shared with her to learn from it. And I thought, wow, felt so real. I couldn't discern that. And um, so I learned about these. Um, some people have imprints. It's not their own incarnation and they don't know it if they don't ask for it or the subconscious does not tell it. That's why uh, in reincarnation therapy, sometimes you had five Cleopatras. Because they have the imprint of the soul of a leader. Cleopatra was a leader. If you want to be a leader as a soul in one life, you will download some imprints of leaders that led the way you would like to lead. Won't you? Okay, so... Uh, how many clients would you say you've had over the years, relatively speaking? Um, I think over a hundred. And so, uh, uh, oh, over a hundred in uh, since 2018, uh, 2018, 2019. So it's like 25 clients a year, relatively speaking. Uh, yes. Okay, so. Um, of all those experiences, is um, is there any one or more experiences that you've taken people through that stand out in your mind that were um, very unusual or that you know that stand that that come to your mind? You know, as far as you'll never forget that uh, taking them through that particular experience, even though it's not your own. It was unusual. Is there any one or two, one or more that you can think of that are like that were that un, um, that stand out for you? Yes, yeah, several. I mean, I had all sorts of um, what we are sold as a fairy or fantasy being. They're all real. I had unicorns. I had fairies. Um, I had a person on another planet. But uh, what I found the most interesting were the ones that were in the new 5D world in the future, because you can't uh, only you cannot only uh, go into a past life. You can also go into uh, a future life. So I found that very interesting and proved to me that time, as we experience it here, does not exist outside our dimension. So, so what? Uh, what did they tell you about the five D world that that stands out in your mind? Well, 
there was one thing about this, the description of the buildings. I had a guy standing in front of a library waiting for his girlfriend. And uh, that sounds very normal. And I asked him, describe the library. And he described things I did not expect. I don't know buildings like that in this world from nowadays. He said they are made of stone. It looks like white stone, maybe marble, but it's not polished and it's not shiny. And um, they're kind of round or elliptical. There are no right angles. The whole thing is very big and high and it's got windows like very long slits with some kind of crystal glass and um, I asked well and why is she going to the library and then the next answer of this guy was also very interesting and struck me because he said um, you know we have everything digital but she wanted to have the touch of paper scrolls and books, which is very um, kind of old school. And I thought, well, okay, everything digital. And she wanted this old fashioned uh, touch of the books. Okay, I um, flash forward a bit. And um, when she came out of the library, uh, I said to him, so where are you going now? Um, he said, well, we're going home. And I said, okay, then go home. Uh, how do you go home? And he said, started laughing. And he said, wow, we have some kind of hover car, like in the Anakin Skywalker film, where this little boy is driving this hovering machine. And I thought, wow, that's really uh, something different. And then I started asking, oh my gosh, where are you? And he said, totally normal, as if natural, we're in 5D New Earth. And I said, wow, describe it more to me. And he said, everything is shining, the light is different, it's brighter, but it's not blending or hurting. And all the plants are glowing, they, they are shining, they, they emit light. That's why everything is so bright. And then I sent him home and had him stop and not enter the house, but stop in front of it and describe it to me. And again, this guy started laughing and said, well, that's the house of my dreams that I built in my fantasy, but now it's real. It was around a tree, was all made of some kind of glass. And uh, the tree was giving light, so he didn't need electricity. It was very funny, and he could touch some of the glass walls, and then there would come out something like uh, a kind of kitchen manifestation if you need it. And if you want to sit, he touched another part of the glass wall of his house, his dream house, and then there manifested uh, something to sit like a couch or something like that. And I was really blown away and I thought, wow, that's that's interesting. So do you think the 5D world, uh, uh, okay, so you hear different people talk about the 5D world and they, yeah, they really. it's, people say different things like, uh, you know, you, you talk to one person and they think, well, the, they don't think that that's possible for us to just evolve to 5D without skipping 4D, you know, with We're the- We're not uh, skipping 4D. 4D is the intermediate between three to five, and it will take shorter time to move through 4D. And as many say, and I feel it also, we already are in the fourth dimension. That's why so many people have psychological problems or entity attachment, because the, the raising of the frequencies is a quasi cleaning of the lower dimensions of 4D. So all the dust and dirt, all the demons and all the 
um, earthbound spirits who didn't go into the light or whatever, they are forced to move, to move up and raise in frequency as well, or try to attach a person to any person which low which has low frequency as well, and then it will bind it and keep it from raising the frequency. So that's some kind of thing, the process we're right in the middle of. So um, when you do QHHC sessions, you do them online through Skype, yes? No. Yep. You do them in person? Yes. All in per all directly in person? Yes. I I do it with uh, people here in Germany. If they know, uh, if they're not too far away, then we can arrange uh, to meet. And um, I know that Dolores did not want to um, do this online. But after she deceased, there were people thinking differently and starting to do it online. And it works. I know it works. But I, for my own responsibility, I have the feeling I want to be with the client, with the person. I mean, um, what could happen that uh, the ear uh, the ear thing is dropping and they don't hear your voice anymore or they start slipping into delta into deep sleep so you can't finish properly and appropriate the hypnosis session but they will just sleep and wake up maybe an hour later who knows Nothing really bad can happen there, I think. But I like to do it in person to have a close uh, a, a starting point and to have a, a closing point and to be with the person. So if anything happens, I remember I watched once um, a BQHHT session online, which means beyond quantum healing hypnosis technique, that BQHHT. And there was a person lying on the bed within uh, hypnosis and everything. And then suddenly her cat came into the room. I saw the little tail while passing through the door and then walking around, passing on the bed. And the cat rubbed on the bed and it was purring. And suddenly the person was annoyed and she said, I feel some strange vibration. I don't know what it is. And... Fortunately, the QHHT uh, practitioner on the other side online so had seen the cat also and said, it's only your cat that came in. Well, if you miss that and the people start get fearful, then uh, this is just no good. So <clears throat> that's why I only do it one on one. So she teaches it online still to this day. Yes. Do you know? The level one practitioner for level two and level three practitioner, you have to uh, go to USA. But it, the first level, you can do it online. You can do it online. Okay. And it combined really beautifully with my medium trainment because uh, when the people describe their things, what they experience during the hypnosis, I very often can enter this picture and I'm seeing it also and experiencing it. And sometimes I can give them a hint. Maybe you want to look at that corner or how do you feel about going over to that house? Something like that. So you're saying but that you're, you're manipulating. So you're saying that your ability, your mediumship type abilities allow you to uh, to co-experience the, what the client is experiencing in their session. You can go into their session and help them. Yes. Um, that's an inter interesting combination. I, I bet there aren't a lot of QHHD people that can do that. Uh, that's, that's nice. Um, I never thought about that, but I think all the QHHD people, they already have some kind of sixth sense. It's maybe not trained like in my uh, case, but um, this kind of work opens you up for a spirituality. You can't help. So in 2019, you uh, started channeling after visiting the Bosnian pyramids and a Sufi sheikh there. Tell us that experience, how that started. Or the well, that was really interesting. 
I um, I wanted to have a second QHHT on myself, so I went again back to that person. And my second uh, QHHT was uh, not an imprint, but an experience of a former or past or parallel life. I think it was in the 12 or 1300s. I was in uh, Turkey. I was a male Sufi and I was uh, hiking to Persia to meet a master where I can get my last initiation, which I needed to complete my cycle or whatever. So I didn't even know that there were pyramids in Bosnia and that there are Muslims and Sufis in, Mo in Bosnia. I didn't know anything about that. Um, friends of mine suddenly came with the idea, well, we saw a video about these pyramids in Bosnia. We would like to make a journey. Would you like to jo join us? And without even thinking if I have enough money for that, I felt my heart saying yes. And I said, wow, yes, OK, I'm coming with you. That's interesting. And uh, that was with a spiritual group. And the guy who uh, organized the group, he had friendship with this Sufi sheikh. And if you put um, some figures from the sacred geometry over a map of this valley, and even just make the lines, connections from one pyramid to the other, right in the middle where all these lines cross from the pyramid of the moon to the pyramid of the sun and the others and the dragon. Right in the middle, there's this Sufi monastery. Isn't that interesting? In the middle of all these energy lines. And the Sufi sheikh was very interesting. Even when I entered their, their area where the monastery was, there suddenly my heart started beating and I couldn't control it. And I never had uh, such an exalted uh, heartbeat. It was really strange for the three hours that I was on this uh, on this place, on this spot, my heart was really doing something else. And uh, you could have a private audience with the Sheikh and could ask him questions. And um, Normally, I have a lot of questions when I was in his private audience. I did not have any question and I didn't know what to say. I was just sitting there and uh, was very strange. And I suddenly said to him, well, I don't have a question, but maybe I can tell you a short story. And I told him that um, I feel in this life I'm searching for the last little piece that is missing. And he said, well, I was the Sufi sheikh from the former life where you got the last piece, the last initiation. And how could he know? I only had this uh, QHHT, my own session, two, way, two or three weeks before um, I went on this journey. So that was really interesting. And the first thing I, I asked uh, at another possibility where he had uh, tea with his pupils and the pupils uh, could ask um, questions and he had his wife and, and tea and things uh, to eat. And the first thing I asked in that uh, situation was, how about the women in Islam? And later on, and he said, well, we honor our women. But I thought, well, they have to go like that and are not allowed to show their hair and things like that and are not allowed to uh, go out on their own without a male uh, company. So I have an issue there. And later on, I found out that in another former life, this sheikh was my father. And he was also a spiritual master or sheikh, and I was his daughter. And I wanted to have the initiation. And he rejected me because I was a woman. Initiation was only for men. 
So interesting that I met this guy again and we became friends. And uh, I think the thing uh, between men and women and father and daughter, all this uh, crazy misunderstanding balanced out also by this experience. And under the pyramid in the tunnels, I also had um, contacts with um, otherworldly beings. Let's put it like that. <laughs> Uh, well, don't, you know, I was just going to push you in that direction and you went in there without me asking. So don't gloss over it. Please tell us about your experiences with the ETs. Go to the very first time you ever um, experienced the ETs and go for, and and please uh, don't gloss over anything. <laughs> okay. All the details. But, okay. I hope I'm not talking too much. No, uh, no, uh, there's no such thing as talking too much. There's okay. lot talk. But, there's talking too little. But there's no such thing. Yes, as about the real things. You're so true. Uh, just let me mention one thing: the uh, experiences and contact with otherworldly beings that I had uh, in the tunnels under the Bosnian pyramids were not with ETs. There, I met knights and a dragon and that was really also very fascinating but about the ets i can tell you oh, that. oh no no okay now that you got me okay <laughs> don't Sorry. jump to the ets now go with the dragon and the knights and then when you get through those then you can go with the ets well we were in the tunnel that guy who was friend with the shaikh also was friend with the uh, guardians of the tunnels so we could enter at night as a small group of eight or ten people and we went in there deep and then we um, switched off the light we sat in pitch dark black and that usually starts the third eye that's all the sense deprivation they did in old uh, egypt with uh, laying in the sarcophagi for three uh, days or they tried to trigger the third eye with the uh, uh, south american priests and use of uh, special plants and things like that it's all about if you if you shut off the light then the inner light the third eye starts working if it's not totally calcified and i was sitting in the darkness and suddenly i had the feeling and i saw a faint image look to me like the head of a horse and i like the ego is babbling all the time in the head it never stops even at these special moments and my head was talking what is the horse doing here down in the tunnel and i thought oh what a stupid comment and then suddenly the horse just blew some smoke through the nostrils opened the mouth a little bit and showed dragon teeth and the eyes started glowing red and I thought with a small voice, OK, you're not a horse, you are a dragon. I understand now. And then it shut its mouth. It didn't want it. To, it did not want to frighten me. It was very friendly and had this um, this kind of the Chinese dragon body. It was like a long snake with wings and tiny arms and foot somewhere. And it was all golden. All the scales were golden. And um, there's another funny thing. There is a rock they found in the tunnels, digging them out from all the rubble that was in there. And on this rock, there were signs. But nobody could decipher them. They're pre-Sumerian, uh, pre-anything we know. They're just lines arrows and dots and a medium once tried to translate what is written on this stone and the guy who, who is very much into the bosnian pyramids who, who found them and started it all dr sam osmanagic i think in one of his small um, books 
he wrote this what she what this medium said was something like the portal is closed we can't go from here we have to stay and wait so that sounds to me as if some kind of entity is uh, somehow trapped there in the bosnian pyramids or in the tunnels underneath i don't know and maybe it's a dragon who knows because i think they come from another realm and i also met some knights they looked like um, well, like the typical cliche we have of the medieval knights in, in this, uh, this armor and, um, <clears throat> and they had the sword and they had the, I don't know how you call this for to, um, oh, I, I'm missing an English word. You know, the typical armor of uh, a knight and um, I don't. Shield, yeah. the, uh, there's the shield, the sword, and the uh, scabbard, and there's all kinds uh, of... Shield, I was looking for the word shield. Shield, okay. Yeah, they had a shield and a sword, and they all kneeled down in the tunnel in front of us, in front of the group, I don't know why, and I got um, an uncomfortable feeling I don't want to kneel in front of anyone but God and he does not want it or she does not want that. And I don't want anyone to kneel in front of me. So I intuitively, instinctively um, reached out and, and showed them, please get up. I don't want you on my knee, on, on your knees. And then they raised and they stood and looked at me and the dragon also was there and they just looked at me so that was one situation oh don't don't go anywhere stay there stay there so so um is there any more details about the dragon you can uh, something um it did or anything about that experience with the dragon that you haven't stated that is Anything more you can say about the dragon? Yes, yes. Um, you probably heard about the war that was there in Bosnia and um, at the town Sarajevo, which is quite close to the Bosnian pyramids. There was a very um, tragic shooting. Um, there was a place in the middle of the town, I don't know whether it was a fountain, a well or something like that, and uh, there were uh, shooters from the mountains who whenever a person uh, was uh, coming out of the house and crossing this uh, place, they shot at them. So. One day we were uh, appointed with our group to go there. And I, as a medium, you can imagine, I already had the feeling, oh, I don't want to go there. There's probably a lot of grief, energy and sorrow and all this, and I don't want to feel it. I know it, had enough of that in my life. Um, okay, but I didn't want to uh, stay behind the group, so... I went with them there and everybody got the feeling I already expected. So we came home from that visit and everybody was feeling down and low and bad. And then in the evening we went into the tunnels and we couldn't help but carry these feelings with us into the tunnel. And then again we switched off the light and... Um, the guy played a crystal singing bowl, which is a really nice frequency. And when he stopped, we heard some kind of noise, like um, as if vapor is coming in into the central heating, some noise like that. And he said, listen to that noise. 
I don't produce it with the with the singing bowl, with a crystal bowl. We have heard this noise uh, very often in here, and this guy, like a man, um, he had some kind of uh, tech tools, measurement instruments, and he was measuring, uh, I don't know what, in there, and he said, there is a presence here. And I felt the presence of the dragon, the golden dragon, and it was coming in like a dragon, like a real golden big snake or serpent. And it was taking from my heart, and later on all the others um, described the same thing, all the sorrow, the sadness, the bad feelings, the empathy with all the, the victims of the war, of the shootings in the town, and just ate it from out of my heart and took it away from me and from every heart of every person that was in there in the tunnels. And we went in there so sad and bad mood, and we came out smiling, uplifted, easy, happy. And I really thanked the dragon, and I, I was so grateful that he healed us from this pain. And there was even a woman in the group, a very rational dentist from Switzerland. And she had the good intuition and she asked, well, whatever force is in here in the tunnel, you helped me, you healed me from this pain and this sorrow and grief. How can I do something good for you? And she heard a voice in her head that, sh that said, to her, show us the outside. And we had made uh, several trips to a valley where there are these great round uh, granite balls that are in Costa Rica also and other trips. And so she opened up her mind library of pictures from our trips. And she had the feeling as if they were going through it. And then suddenly, um, I'm playing the hand pan. That's a special instrument in 432 hertz, which is uh, a very special frequency and got a very nice tone. And I was sitting in this valley with the little river and these big uh, granite balls, and I was playing there. And uh, she saw me and heard me. And the spirits or the dragon spirit from the tunnel found this picture in her and asked her, what is that? And she said, that's one from this group. She's playing this instrument. And they said, can she play it in here in the tunnels for us, please? And she told me after that, that uh, she got this message and I, th I thought by myself, okay, well, I, I'm trying, of course, but I can't play in pitch dark because I need to know where I put my hands on the instrument. I need to see the, uh, the tone fields where to, um, where to, oh, another word missing, where to touch or to hit like a drum. So I brought a candle with me, and the next time in the tunnel, um, we switched off the light. I had brought the handpan, and even with all the vapor and the humidity in the tunnel, it's a metal instrument, so with wooden instrument, that wouldn't have worked. A flute or something else would never work in there. And I played for them and lit the candle to see my tone fields, and um, obviously they liked it. That was new for them. So because of that, um, that asking of them from the tunnels to show the outside gave me the idea maybe they, they even can't go outside. They are bound to be in these tunnels can't see the outside world, although they are fourth dimensional. I don't really understand it, but they wanted to see pictures from outside. And they asked this woman to uh, to invite me to play in the tunnels on the handpan. So that's a that's an awesome story. You know, the the dragon ate your sorrow, all of your sorrow. Uh, I don't think I've heard a story quite as interesting as that. That's that's very unique uh, event. 
Um, so, uh, thank you for sharing. So, uh, you have had how many, relatively speaking, how many experiences have you had with ETs in your lifetime? I've never counted them. They started uh, in the last two or three years. No, they started earlier. Well, um, let me have a look. I'm looking at my timetable. <laughs> It doesn't have to be exact, just kind of a ballpark, you know, is it like 10, 50, 100, just ballpark. How many do you think you've had relatives for hundreds or, th you know, two or three or, you know. With ETs, I think there are only maybe eight or 10 in the last um, one and a half year. Oh, so it's a relatively new experience for you. Yes, but they already started some years ago. That was something um, really interesting for me as I give um, as a medium public dams with small groups in public where I give messages to the people. And I had a guy there and he seemed to be very resistant because he was sitting with crossed arms and crossed legs as if I don't want to be here. And usually you have more women uh, than men coming to uh, a medium giving messages. And when I uh, placed myself in front of this guy, picking up his energy, I immediately, without effort, had the first image. And this image showed the Gizeh pyramids and they were, they were lighting up like lamps from the inside with glowing white light. And I got the idea, wow, they are energy machines. They produce some kind of light or they work with energy. And then, then I was um, drawn to look to the left of the pyramids. And there were two extraterrestrials, the typical gray type um, beings in very bright or light overalls. And they were telling me a message which I should give to this man. And I thought by myself and telepathically told them, well, if I do this in public, everybody will think I'm nuts. I can't talk about aliens and ETs and things like that. And they said, please try it. It's important for him. So I used my mediumship trainment and started very cautiously just asking the men, are you interested in Egypt, maybe the pyramids? Maybe you want to make a journey to see the pyramids. And that guy, without any motion, without moving anything in his face or his crossed arms, just said, I'm an engineer and I'm interested in ancient technology. And this was the magic word. Woof! It opened the door like a floodgate and I had to tell the message without uh, leaving anything out. And I didn't even care at that moment for the public, the others who were sitting there with eyes like that. And this guy, his reaction was really interesting. He, After I finished, he just said, Chaka, I was waiting for that. Thank you so much. And when he went out, he gave me his card and he already mentioned that he was an engineer and I could read on his card so-and-so, his name, and he is an engineer. And under the engineer, he had the line, solutions from the quantum field. So he already had contact and um, with whatever, however, and um, that was very funny for me. But it opened up my horizon because, well, I... I hadn't ETs and ships and craft and all this on the screen. I've heard about it, but it wasn't in my day-to-day -day life. After this appearance, uh, giving a message from ETs to a guy in a public uh, dam, I went home and started researching, and I oh, found oh, so oh, many oh, things. Stop for a second. Okay. Uh, hold that thought. Okay, so go back, back up for a second. 
what was the message the ETs had you give him? What did they what did they want you to say to him? What specifically did they want you to say? They said we are from the race of the builders. Tell him he is of the same race of the old builders as well. And tell him he will invent something which is not 3D but will be built in 4 and 5D. So I couldn't do anything with that message, but he was uh, obviously waiting for a sign and got whatever he wanted. He enjoyed the message. He enjoyed it. Okay, you go know, forward now. To, now you went home and you start researching. Go ahead, go ahead with your story. Just one other thing. I try to make it short. The English training of mediumship, which I uh, trained in, they only accept um, verifiable senders, which are your deceased father, mother, grandfather, grandmother, uncle, and so on. And uh, if you can't verify the sender, then you got to check the message energy-wise. Is it good, positive, uplifting, or does it feel uh, commanding or um, forcing? Um, is it operating with words like, you have to, and if you're not, and things like that, like creating fear. You always have to check the energy. And the English tradition and my teachers never um, wanted that people um, channel anything else but the deceased, because they say the deceased are your family, your father, mother, grandfather. They are bond with you with uh, by the bonds of love. They won't harm you. But any other entity can do as if it's your grandmother, can um, come to you uh, as an angel and it's uh, something else instead. So uh, that's a whole field and you need a lot of discernment. Stick with the deceased. But I'm that kind of pupil who tries the borders and the limitations, and I had to find out that they are right. You don't really know whom you've got on the other end of the line. And I checked the message, and I checked the energy, and it felt good, but um, today I'm not sure. Um, I found out researching that there are several type of gray beings. They are the small ones that look like childs. They are usually androids with a minimum um, AI program. They are used as workers by many races on the ships. They, they do the work and sometimes they even navigate. And then there are the tall greys, which are not so benevolent. Then there are the Orion greys and the Zeta Reticuli. So it gets very convoluted, like Dolores Cannon's convoluted universe, and very, oh, it's too much. But there are so many interesting things. There is an ancient builder race, must have been, and no one of the ETs knows who they were. They are the ones who left the ruins on Mars, Moon, and the Earth. In the whole solar system, they have been here before all our lost civilizations, the ones we know of and the ones we don't know of. So that's a riddle and a mystery. And I don't think that the great type beings belong to the ancient builder race. Maybe they said builder race or ancient builder race, that's something different, I don't know. But uh, they graze, they're usually known as not telling the truth. I don't know. They told me their name. They said they are the Ebens. Never heard that name. After I googled it, I found it out. And uh, I know that Ebens exist, but they're not the, the well-meaning uh, fraction, as to my knowledge of today. 
But at that moment, it felt positive. It felt good. The guy was content and I also had a good feeling. I didn't feel any bad energy. So, so much for that. <laughs> so go to your next, uh, your next ET experience after that one. Go to the next one. Uh, the next one was after I saw with my own 3D eyes, uh, really three craft in the sky. Of course, my attention uh, went there and I was um, quite open and interested. And then one evening, you know, to me as a medium, I don't know whether this is normal for other people as well. When I close my eyes, I'm in the stream of consciousness. I see pictures, images, video clips, things I don't know, things that are not from this world. There are colors and beings I've never seen before. So I, I already stopped trying to understand all this. And I heard for years and years, my guides uh, just imprinting me with one word, they said, focus, focus, focus. So I understood, okay, I need to focus something and not the whole stream of all the pictures and all the things. And okay, I was in bed, I closed my eyes and I had the feeling there's somebody in my bedroom. I couldn't see them, but I could feel them. And with my inner eye, I could see them. And then very rapidly, like whoosh, I was on a ship and it was the same kind of light that I saw emitted from the pyramids. It's this white crystalline light. I was in a room, everything was white, very bright, as if I'm sitting in a crystal singing bowl and it is lit up by light, but there was no source of light, no light bulbs or anything like that. Just the walls, the, the, the floor, everything was emitting this crystalline white light. And the funny thing was, I only saw legs in blue uniform. I couldn't look up, my sight was blocked. I found out later on, um, in the Tibetan or Indian tradition, they know this. It's got to do with your consciousness. If you're not able or not already um, at the right frequency, you can't see higher than your own frequency in lower 5D or upper 4D, whatever. So I found it strange because I felt like these uh, little typical German dogs with very short legs and this long uh, body, they see people only up to their knees. They see feet and knees. That's all. And I felt like that, like a dachshund, like this little dog. <laughs> I was on the ship and I, I looked out of my eyes and the only thing I saw was hips and legs in blue uniforms. So... I supposed they, if I see only legs and I'm nearly 168, so they are double. And I know that the Pleiadians are three to, yeah, three meters more or less. So they're double our size. And I disliked it that I, that my vision was blocked and I, had to acclimate and I wanted to ask what am I doing here and why didn't you ask me because they just took me and I dislike that sorry I have an issue when I'm not asked and invited because I know this world is free will you have to consent they have to ask you if they just take you that's against prime directive uh, do not interfere with free will well that's my opinion and as I'm trying to acclimate and trying to formulate my question, why am I here? What's it all about? I had the feeling like gigantic spider legs were crushing in on the craft. And so, boom, I was out. I found myself in the bed. And I think because I uh, was a little bit frightened, I just jumped back into my body and I felt it as an attack and I didn't like it 
Later on, I was thinking, well, I only cared for myself. What happened to them? Then my guides answered, they're okay. You don't have to um, think about them. But maybe, maybe next time you can react differently. Instead of bringing yourself into safety, you can ask the others, what do we do? And maybe act um, together, whatever. So just another perspective. Okay, I thought by myself, well, hmm, okay, might be. Then sometime later, again, I was taken to the ship, felt the same. I think it was the same ship and the same Pleiadians. But that time I was in a natural um, surrounding. I know on the ships they have some kind of... Um, uh, it's not holographic, it's real. It's real trees, grass and greenery and waterfall and everything. They really have a landscape there. They have a, a, a nature park very big in there. And I was in the, this nature part of the craft. And I was in a circle standing with other beings. Um, they didn't look very different to me. They seemed to be human or at least Pleiadian. I I didn't notice any difference, so I, I didn't look very much at them because suddenly I had on a chain around my neck, I had a big crystal in front of my chest and everybody had a chain with a crystal. And because I'm a um, kind of musician and I love music and harmonies, they started toning and singing, and I'm toning as well, and especially overtones. So I just couldn't help. When they started, I entered the harmonies and I sang and toned with them. And by this um, creation of tone and sound, suddenly all the crystals in front of the chests started to glow and emit light. So it was some kind of light your crystal ceremony. I don't know what. I wasn't told anything. And after that, that was a pleasant experience. I was back in my bed again. And I did not know, still do not know what to make out of that. Although it was a pleasant experience, I would have liked to know uh, the reason, what it is for, what I compart, uh, uh, in which I took, uh, oh, again, the words English. Oh, sorry. Uh, which which was my participation in whatever ceremony for whatever reason. So I never got an answer to that. And after that, then came to my opinion, the real things. Again, I felt a presence in my, um, in my bedroom and I asked them, what do you want? Who are you? And they said, we are the Pleiadians. We are with you since long, long time. And we invite you to come to our ship. And I thought, bingo, they ask me. So now I can say yes or no. And I said, of course, I'd like to come. And they said, okay, you want help? And they reached out like giving their hand to me to take me into this beam or whatever. And I said, like a child, no, I want to do it on my own. And they smiled at me and I created this white beam and whoosh, I was on the ship and they also with me, whoosh. And then again, we were, it was two Pleiadians, a man and a male and a female. And I was with them in a room on another ship, not like the first two experiences. I felt they are a different uh, group. And I asked them, well, um, why, why am I here? Anything I, I should know? What do you want? Um, anything I have to learn? And they just made like this, come, follow. And they brought me to a room and in that room they showed me a glass tube with a body inside and the body was human 
in a glass tube with some kind of liquid filled and it was in, I think, well, I call it stasis. It was in suspended motion. And this body had a feline head, so with cat features in the face. And when they brought me in front of the body and I looked at it, I suddenly knew, well, that's me. <laughs> and I wasn't neither shocked nor astonished. It was like natural. I thought, well, yeah, that's me. I know. I know that is me. And then I was back in my bed again. And for the next time, I was wondering, well, why did they show that to me? Um, I always loved cats. I even have a strange cat that does not belong to me, that's coming to visit me every two or three days. To me, it's an honor because I know they can see into the fifth dimension and they are very, very sensitive and spiritual animals. So, um, well, no great shock. And um, after a few weeks, again, they appeared in my bedroom and they are very, um, how to say it? They are very polite. They just make themselves no noticeable. I feel their presence. And when I acknowledge them and say, okay, you're here, uh, what do you want? Then they answer. And they came when I was still in some kind of meditation. Before I sleep, I do my own breath work and meditation thing. And I felt them and I said, not now, please wait five minutes until I finish my meditation. They said, okay, no problem. And I finished my meditation and then I went with them on board the ship again. And... I asked them, well, I don't understand what's the big thing about the feline body uh, or the body with the feline head to show it to me. I can integrate that. That's no problem for me. So anything else? And they said again, come with us. And they brought me again to the room with a tube. And this time when I stood in front of the tube, the glass tube with the body with feline features in it, Looking at it, the feline body opened the eyes and looked at me. It was waking up the same moment I was looking at it. So I still have to figure out what that means. I get the feeling that there's some kind of connection because I looked back and there was some kind of magnetic thing which, um, which clicked in and... Um, as they say, the eyes are the windows of the soul. I, I wait what I will understand in the next time. So there's some kind of connection. I already felt that I'm alien and not from this planet. And um, I'm a Star Trek fan. So whenever I close my eyes, I got the feeling I can easily walk around in these ships. That's nothing strange or alien to me. So I that was already there was already fruitful soil for all this and now i'm just getting the confirma confirmation so much for that <laughs> um okay so hold on a second my light has dimmed so i will try to make it a little brighter all right uh, oh, oh, there we go that's good, that's good enough um so, you've had quite a life. Uh, you learned a lot with the Rosicrucians. You uh, have been a medium. So, working now, what do you spend the most time doing? Of all the things you do, what do you do the most to, you know, for a living, uh, for helping people or making money or the combination? What, what? do you spend most of your time doing? Well, officially, I'm uh, retired as a graphic designer. And I live from um, my deceased husband's uh, pension. I hope that's the right word. So I don't have to work or earn money with mediumship. And 
I so like you don't it. have to do anything. You, you can just hang out. Uh, yes. And after my second husband, love of my life, uh, transitioned, I thought, now I, I'm going to do what I love to do, and only that. So I have some clients, but not very many. I don't want to uh, work very heavily now because I'm already 66. I want to have enough free time. I do my meditation. I have my garden and work in the garden. I do a lot of research in uh, things that interest me, like archaeology and ufology and things like that. But not too much because I want to um, um, keep the channel clean and not um, get biased or get too much information that could mix in. I, I like the first experiences when I started channeling because um, I felt it's the same energy I felt uh, of my own higher self during the quantum uh, hypnosis sessions, so I already knew the energy and recognized it. And um, there were things coming out of my mouth which I knew were not my knowledge. And I sometimes, even nowadays, get the feeling when I'm doing channeling as if some, I call it the hands of God, <laughs> I see sometimes real hands coming from heaven and they they are using my my images and my phrases and words and my knowledge and whatever I know to to bring out the message in the best possible form. And mostly which I get a little bit bored of um people ask during the Q&A uh, channeling, they ask things like um, about a new home or a new house or a new job or what about the Mr. Wright and Mrs. Wright. And I would so much love to have people who ask, well, what's the nature of reality or something like that? But nobody asks that. They're all more into the practical day-to-day -day, uh, challenges they have. I can understand that. But sometimes here and there, there's a question where they put something more into the answer. And I'm always astonished what, what kind of knowledge is coming out of me that I have never put in there. I'm trying to put in knowledge now into me. And I learned along the way. But... I still feel like just scratching the surface. So when you're channeling, are you are you present in your body, partially present, or how does that work? I'm totally present. I don't give my body to uh, any other entity. And as I know, every other entity have to pass your higher self which is more or less the same energy uh, that Dolores Cannon named the subconscious we always put these names it's not about the names it's the energy the vibration so I already knew this energy and as we are multi uh, dimensional beings we have an aspect of our soul or higher self living on every dimen dimension. So if a being wants to be channeled by a person here on earth, they have to ask the higher self of the person. If there's an agreement or even a soul contract before the incarnation that uh, allows it, then okay. And there are different types of channeling. There are total trends like um, Edgar Casey, for instance. He, he took a nap and while the nap, the people asked him and is more or less QHHT, staying in theta uh, brainwave stage and prolonging it through asking questions. So 
there's full trans, there's half trans. Uh, I only, to me, it's, um, I'm totally conscious. I hear the words coming out of my mouth and I listen to them as if I am a listener like all the others. And I only step, <clears throat> um, how to name, how to word this. I, I take a step back with my ego and I leave some kind of, um, you know, inside of me, it's like a picture. This is what I do. You know, the old films when there was only one spotlight coming to the stage and in this spotlight stood the comedian and told his joke. So it's like that inside of me. There's a spotlight, there's a column of white light coming down. I have to say okay to that. If I don't say okay, then channeling won't work. I have to um, consent. And I always say inside of myself, okay, I'm ready. And then the light comes down, that column of white light. And from there comes the action and the words. And they use whatever they find in my personality or in my memory or wherever. So speak about your guides. Uh, you, uh, how many guides do you have? Do you know their names? How did you meet them? Uh, tell us anything about your guides that that you understand. I don't know how many I have. I learned that everybody has at least one. Most of the time, it's a team of spirit guides. And in whichever phase of your life you are in, there are steps for another to guide you through this phase. So you have your one guardian angel and a team of spirit guides with, um, although they are many or more than one or two, they speak with one voice and they often, um, they often, also act as one so that's why in phases of your life where you need this then there will step forward uh, this guy so many people um have all kinds of 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 uh, uh, spirit guides can be family usually it's more the grandfather it's um it makes a leap over one generation um it could be guides where people told me they saw with me an Indian master or a Tibetan master. I don't know. The only one that really came to me once and really um, um, showed herself to me was Kuan Yin. And as I'm German, uh, that was really funny to me because I had no idea. I never liked China and... Uh, all this Chinese stuff and Kuan Yin, I didn't know what to do with that. And then I started researching and found out, wow, she's the goddess of empathy. And there's a story about her which I really liked and that touched me and brought me to tears that she could have left the world and on the threshold she turned around and saw still suffering beings and then she turned around and said i will not go with one who's left here suffering so she rejected her own enlightenment and came back to the world to assist uh, the ones who are still suffering and searching and trying yeah whoa that uh Okay, she appeared once in front of me and said to me, I am Kuan Yin, I am one of your spirit guides, you can call on upon me every time. And uh, with her was a water dragon, green color, and a lot of pink clouds, like... Uh, yeah, like the, the cherry flower in Japan, something that light pink color. So makes sense to me that this is the color because uh, our Valentine greeting cards, the hearts are always pink or red. And the softer version, the empathy 
is uh, well more a rosé or a soft pink. So that's the only one I know. So when your guides talk to you, um, do you hear it as thoughts, sounds, both, or s pictures, or everything all of the above, or what? How do you? How do they communicate with you? Um, I think they use all senses, but as I started as um, how do you call it? clear feeling because all our five senses feel see hear taste smell and know they have some kind of um, invisible pro prolongation uh, into the other dimensions or densities so there's clear feeling there's clear hearing clear seeing um, I had people that could taste something that wasn't there. Angels always uh, or very often leave some some smell, faint smell of flowers. Many people talk about that. Other people suddenly taste something or they suddenly know without knowing where they do know this from. So I started with a feeling sense. I get a feeling, I get a vibration. Training in the mediumship circles uh, with colleagues, with exercises, you can train your other senses. And um, I'm good in language. I'm speaking four languages. I'm a musician, so I'm very open for sound and tone. Sometimes I hear a word or even a short sentence. <laughs> um, sometimes I see pictures. But I know because they showed me their messages. They are in wave form, they are frequencies and vibrations. And I, as an instrument, medium is nothing other than a channel. Um, they, they tune me, they use whatever they can, what I have as um, a treasure to, to translate their vibrations into a message. Okay. Um, <laughs> it kind of leaves you speechless. Uh, and I don't know what to say. So um, you mentioned earlier about attaching spirits. Um, I have a special. Oh, hold on. Ah, my light is changing. One second. Let's see if I can. There we go. Uh, so um, yeah, you mentioned earlier about attaching spirits. Do you um, have much experience dealing with those types of things or in your life? With Unfortunately, your yes. <laughs> so uh, please do tell uh, as much as you'd like to go over in this area. That's an area of uh, special interest to me, you might, th you might say. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they already told me that. So I have a special story for you. Um, I once came across in a QHHT session um, a real demon that was living inside a woman, 80-year-old, a German woman. Um, she had been to an African shaman 20 years before, and this guy told her, You've got two attachments. One I can uh, drive out now. The other one I can't. You have to stay with that or find someone who can drive this out. So she had this one spirit attachment driven out and was living for over 15 years with the other one and couldn't find anyone. And she didn't tell me. We weren't talking about that. She wanted a QHHT. And I wasn't um, expecting that. <laughs> and she, she didn't even reach into um, the hypnosis state, the deeper alpha state. That being made himself present um, rapidly and started talking 
and it was um, kind of unfriendly. It was grunting, and um, it said, "Oh, stupid cow!" She called her a stupid cow, and I started talking with that being. Usually, I don't know. I, I wouldn't have done that because I felt totally unprepared—not totally unprepared, but unprepared for that. But I had the feeling as if some kind of um, glass bell was coming from above and was shielding me. And suddenly, I was totally neutral and with a soft and kind and friendly voice, I was talking to a demon. And I thought by myself, whoa, that's strange. And I asked him some questions. How did you get into her? What are you doing there? Why are you uh, haunting her? And that being, um, I mean, you can't talk even as a human and not uh, let out some truth. So that being uh, in the conversation, it told me that it came in via Sai Baba. So that's a funny thing because I had been to his ashram before. And when I was there at the age of 28, I didn't feel good. I didn't like his voice, the vibration. So I shut myself off and closed myself off. And there he comes again. And this woman had the whole um, house filled with pictures and frames of Sai Baba, her guru, and she tried as a Westerner, that's impossible with our mental state, she tried that devotee thing to surrender totally and the master, the guru will take me to enlightenment. I don't have to do anything. I'm just a sack of human flesh and he will transport me to some higher realm. This this kind of uh, surrender is, to my opinion, sorry, don't want to uh, offend anyone. I think it's false and it's um, still some kind of childish because there's no responsibility in it. You just want to have it made. You want to have the pill on the silver tablet and you don't want to invest any work of your own. So she was totally open up to Sai Baba. And in this open canal, there can come in some other entities. And while talking with him, he also told me um, that she was the incarnation now of an Atlantean priestess, and she has got special knowledge, which he wants to prevent from to, to come out. So he is blocking, the demon was blocking her on purpose because of the old ancient Atlantis knowledge she had. And I'm kind of a uh, straight and upright person. I don't like um, these intrigues and games from behind. And if you do something uh, without anyone knowing and you're living in his auric field and uh, you don't go, um, well, I think there's some kind of unfairness. And the first thing he, he said to me is, she invited me. And I know from reading the Indian tradition, the Mahabharata, they always say that. The reptilians always said the earth is ours, we were the first, or you invited me. That's what the, the bad spirits like to say, as if it, that gives permission for them to stay. So I said to him, well, maybe unknowingly she let you in in former days. But now she does not want you any, anymore and I ask you to leave with all your minions and everything you planted in her. And I tried to, um, to call on Jesus, Source, whatever, Archangel Michael. That demon only laughed at me and didn't move a centimeter. And I couldn't do anything. I had to uh, stop and finish the uh, session. 
and I was really kind of pissed off and it just uh, it just sucked that I couldn't help this woman and couldn't do anything. And on the way home driving, I suddenly was thinking about my perceptions that I had while talking with him and while being in the in the hypnosis session. And I had a strong feeling felt so Indian, some kind of Indian or Tibetan demon. And then I suddenly heard my guides tell me, okay, mark another session with that woman. Do your part until you cannot go any further. Then call us in, the Indian deities, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva and Krishna. And we will do the rest of the work. Okay. I tried that. We made a second uh, uh, date. And I did what I could to lead the woman into the alpha brainwave state. And then already the demon appeared and uh, started to disturb. And then I called in Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva and Krishna and asked them to remove this entity with all its triggers and connections and backup and reset programs. And then I was allowed to see a picture and that was really funny because I had only a feeling of the demon and I had no picture. I was allowed to see the picture of really like in the books, in the old Tibetan books, a fat, blue-skinned demon with eyes that came out of the skull and a teeth, uh, a mouthful of teeth. And he was walking like a duck, very slowly, uh, getting out of the astral field of this uh, person. And then I saw Krishna and his spear. And he was stabbing the demon into uh, his leg to make him move and go faster. And the demon was <laughs> starting to move a bit faster. And I thought, wow, that's great. So they are leading him out. I couldn't do it and I didn't know what to do. And all the Christian tradition, Jesus uh, and Archangel Michael didn't help. So I had to call upon his higher lords who can command him, which are the Indian or Tibetan deities. So that makes sense to me afterwards. Um, hold on. I gotta set my light again. Uh, that was uh, a pretty amazing story. Thank you very much for sharing. <laughs> Uh, ha have you had any other experiences with uh, yes. Markle? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, how many, relatively speaking, how many uh, similar experiences have you had? Ballpark. Um, the other, the other ones weren't that drastic with a, with like this uh, Tibetan demon, but. Um, there were um, attachments on people. Another one was um, maybe quite interesting. I had uh, participated in a sound uh, healing group meeting in a park in the summer in Germany with um, some other people, some of my friends who are also spiritual or therapist or whatever, working in the spiritual field, and just uh, people they knew or friends who brought friends. So we had a group there and we were toning and um, doing sound healing. And after that, there was a young woman, maybe 25 years of age, that got my number from out of the group and she approached me via WhatsApp and she started throwing things at me. First, she was doing uh, the honeypot thing. Oh, I heard you're a medium. Oh, how wonderful. Can you tell me? Blah, 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 blah. And she just wanted to know and know and know. And through uh, 10 or 20 WhatsApp the day at me, 
So after one day, I said, stop. This does not work like that. If you have so many questions, you can book a session with me, but we're not friends. And this is too much. I don't want it like that. Um, can you please uh, take a step back? And she said, oh, yes, of course, sorry. And next day again, she sent 20 WhatsApp and I felt there's something wrong. And I, I felt something is reaching out and was grabbing after me, even astrally. And it just didn't feel right. And I couldn't understand it. And I thought, what does she want from me? I already said no, and she's still trying. It went to a point where I said, if you don't stop bothering me day to day, don't you have a life of your own with your questions and your situations and your things? I will have you forced to me to block you on WhatsApp. I'm sorry, but just if you don't stop sending me things. So she did it again. I blocked her. The first person I ever blocked. <laughs> I've never done that before. And I just couldn't understand it. And at night in bed, I asked really from deep of my heart, uh, I said to spiritual world, my guides, whomever, guys, I need to understand that. What is reaching out from her and is bothering me that I'm even lying here in bed thinking, oh, maybe I'm a bad person. I'm not a good spiritual person. I did not answer her. I reject her, blah, 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 blah. all this ego stuff, this polarity. Um, and they showed me a picture. I saw her face, and from her face, they were going out like tentacles. Some, I always perceive um, dark or negative energy, like, um, like dark, cloudy material, or like uh, pieces of, of things that burnt in the fire that are flowing in flocks around. And, to me, it looked like the Greek, um, um, who's she called? The Medusa, the the head with the uh, with the serpents. So it was moving, and there were dark tentacles like reaching out to me. And when I saw that, I understood. Oh, this woman's got an attachment, and the attachment is trying to attach to me. Okay. And then I asked another friend, a shaman, and I only told her the name and asked uh, she if she can have a look or a feel into that. I needed confirmation to not do something wrong. And she said, well, I even see the being that's attached to her. It's sitting behind her in the neck. That's why our language still transports things like, I've got problems on my shoulder or something in my neck. So that's where they attach, attach usually. And she was seeing this being as some kind of um, um, a bad pixie or something like that, or a bad gnome. And I couldn't see that being, but I started a session and I asked the white light, the source, and all the angels and my helpers to remove all the attachment that this being already had put into my auric field. And if it's allowed and not interfering with the free will of the other person, the young woman, she surely didn't know that she was abused by this uh, energy being attached to her. So if it's allowed, then I ask the angels to remove this being from her also with all the triggers and connections and the backup and reset programs and heal the um, the space where this energy uh, was in her aura and seal it with white light so that no other low energy can come in, in my field and in her field. And just one hour later after I did that session for myself and my prayer, I was allowed to see a picture. I saw two angels who were escorting on every side the being that was attached to that woman. And it was looking like um, 
some kind of Irish gnome with a very ugly face. Uh, he had warts everywhere and he had really shiny red hair. And he was very nasty. And um, of course, he disliked that I had found him and had uh, more or less like uh, sent the police, sent the angels after him and they escorted him out now. And he turned his head back to me and said something nasty to try to hurt me again. And I just sent him my love and, and sa said, bless you, go to the light, be happy, be free. So that was another one that I could help to detach. And I remember the first one I encountered in a quantum hypnosis session was a young man at the age of 25. And suddenly, without expecting anything during the hypnosis, through the mouth of this young man, some thing, somebody started yelling at me. Piss off! I don't like you! Shut your mouth! Be quiet! Piss off! Fuck off! Really like that. And I thought, Woo, what's that? And then again came this glass kind of cylinder or bell-shaped thing above me from, from above and shielded me. And I started talking with this entity and I said, why are you so angry? Who are you? Do you know that you live in the auric field of another living person and that you are hindering him and block him and he can't go on on his journey and you can't carry on with your soul journey because you're inside another body's auric field and you're not on your path you're not in the beyond you're not with the light with your guides or your guardian angel and he started to understand and it was a young man who got killed um, some kind of traumatically and he died in anger so anger was the only thing he knew. That was the emotion with which, the vibration, the frequency of anger, with which he left his former body. So he was magnetically drawn to the same frequency, to anger in another person. And this young man said, I'm a very lovely, friendly person, but sometimes I just explode and I yell and I don't know where this anger comes from. And after that, we knew where this anger come, came from. He had some anger that wasn't resolved or healed. And there, this being could attach this other young man who died in anger. And so... This anger grew more and more and started to disturb the life of the young man. And uh, the other one didn't even know that he was dead. After I told him, I, I offered that the angels can guide him out now to a place uh, where he belongs because of his frequency or back to the light. And he accepted and even left a positive message at the end Going out of the client's uh, body, he said, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I wish you luck and blessings for your own soul path. Look at that. So you can do something and you can move some spirit's mind who's lost and just doing something unknowingly, which is totally wrong. Um, can you hold on for just one minute? Yes, of course. Right. I know talking very I'll much. Right
Uh, thank you for holding. <laughs> no problem. Um, so did your guides tell you that I have attaching spirits? No. Usually they don't do that, and beforehand I I never uh, sense into another person without their um, their Perfect. consent, free will. But I can't help to pick up some things sometimes. the The big trick of my teachers was that they created in the in the uh, invisible some kind of mechanism like a switch to switch on your medial um, senses to perceive focused, intensified for a session, a reading, when you need it, when it's really helpful and needed, and to switch it off, to, know, to not get everything of everybody when you have to buy your grocery at the grocery stores or in the supermarket. I don't want to walk the streets and get every feeling and every uh, thought of everybody. So I like to switch myself on and off. And I really love this technique because I, I already pick up enough without being switched on. <laughs> Good. OK, so I don't pick up anything with you. Oh, if okay. you do that and I focus my attention now on you, I don't pick up any attachment. Yeah, well, I've, I've got them. There's no question. Uh, so um the only thing that i pick up is that you have um some very strong let's say you know thought streets the the path of your thoughts there are many, many roads and pathways, and some are very strong, and they are connected with um, what I would call uh, the dark side or the negative because you want to know and understand. So you got a resonance there, but you don't have negative attachment of beings as far as I can notice. So what would you tell uh, people who know that they you know people who have attachments in general you know as a sort of a parting uh you know we could go on for a long time i'm sure you have plenty of other experiences you could tell everybody but you've entertained the audience for for uh over two hours now and uh, it's been it's been a, a nice ride i mean it was great hearing about the dragon eating your sorrows and and uh, your ET experiences and the demons you worked uh, to uh, remove. It, it was good stuff. So uh, in general, if you if somebody said, you know, they had attachments, uh, what would you tell people in general about such things, if anything? I think in the beginning, a person with no spiritual training or experience will think and feel that they cannot remove this by themselves. So they should go and look for help. Usually shamans know how to deal with that. Not every medium knows how to deal with that. And not every energy worker knows how to deal with that you know there are so many even documentaries and tv where the people go the guys go with all their instruments to the haunted houses and they ask the spirits there or the demons or whatever is stuck there is there somebody and they get the yes well What's the use of asking a spirit who's stuck or bound to a place, a house or any local uh, place? Are you there if you can't offer help? These spirits or whatever they are, they are stuck there because they, um, they haven't found their way to the light. They are uh, maybe souls of deceased persons with a lot of attachment to matter, to houses, 
to to money to family and uh, if they don't go into the light after they uh, transitioned and 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 uh, um, decide to stay there well okay then they need very often somebody who helps them who can open a portal to let them out into the light or call the angels and let them uh, be guided to where they belong to. You can open a light portal with the uh, Indian Agni Hotra fire, rit uh, fire ritual. You can also um, call on deceased or stuck negative energy, spirits, entities, beings, and ask them, now you can use this tunnel of light from the Agni Hotra uh, fire ritual and you can go um, to a higher world, to a higher realm, into the light. And many of them, they just wait for an opportunity like that. So if you go to a haunted house uh, and you can't offer them a way out or a helping hand, you're not doing anything good. You're just uh, um, measuring that there is some kind of uh, magnetic anomaly, which you maybe call ghost. And you ask him, are you there? And what is your name? And this doesn't help anything. So people who have an attachment in the beginning, they need help. Although I know you can do it on your own if you have a little knowledge. Just call on source on your own divine spark inside of your heart where your soul is attached to this body and and ask for help. Ask Arch Archangel Michael to remove the entity. Or um, if, if you know some clearing and cleansing rituals from tr shamanic traditions, they have a lot of knowledge about that. They know how to deal with that. Go and search for help or at least do research. Um, even in Google, you can find some things that you can do on your own. Many people try to um, to use sage or white sage in their uh, in their uh, rooms to get um, bad energy or spirits out, but they should better use um, frankincense. Yeah, I've heard that most recently. Um, yeah, it, it's not a coincidence that the church put all this on their frankincense and they use too much. But they know, they still know about some of these old uh, magical traditions and the old knowledge, the Gnostic knowledge, and they know what they do in some cases. So it's been a pleasure talking with you. Uh, I really enjoyed hearing all your stories. I'm sure that anybody who listens to your this uh, interview will enjoy uh, listening to you as well. So is there anything uh, you would like to say to the people in general before we uh, finish? I, I really appreciate you coming on the show and uh, spending this much time, and uh, it's been a pleasure. Do you want to say any last thing before we stop the recording to, to anybody by any chance? Yes. Okay. One very simple thing. Negative energy beings, they don't like happy sounds. So if you sing, if you dance, if you do whatever makes you happy, what makes your heart jump with joy, you drive them out more or less because they can't stand the high vibration. And if you need some help, then use binaural beats that can help you transform anger, grief, and whatever. They are specially made for, for the entrainment of the brain to, to create new pathways for new ideas, new thinking, um, new, new perspectives. So really, with all the chaos in the world and all the preoccupation. Don't worry, it really makes it more worse if you worry. Be happy. Do the best to be happy because when you are in good shape, good state and good brainwave state and then everything else is going much easier. Take it easy, but take it. We are responsible. Responsibility means 
the ability to respond. So how do you respond to whatever comes your way? You can say yes, no, or neutral. Hmm, interesting. Maybe, I'm not sure yet. But we are we are really more or less forced now to choose. Everybody's got to choose. The first things I heard after my mediumship trainment for two or three years were, was always in my ear, what do you want? What do you wish? And it took me years to understand, I have to make a wish. I have to focus my intent. Then I can call all the helping forces and angels and whatever and masters or sages in to to help me. But if I haven't um, put my focus onto a goal, then they can't help me. And most people don't know that you have to ask for help because they, the good ones, respect free will. The bad ones, not. They come without being asked. So, put your focus on happiness. Do something good. Sing tone that will lighten up and raise your frequency. Thank you very much for spending your time with us, uh, Gabby Heikheim. Uh, uh, I wish you the best with all your everything you do, and thank you very much uh, for being on the show. Thank you again. Let me stop the recording now. Uh.